First Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. First Peter chapter 1 verse 13. If uh, you can pray for me. Uh, so today has been uh, very uh, weary for me because uh, just a lot of things to do. And it's usually, uh, I think you're used to it by now. I think onlineers are used to it by now too. There are times when I come to preach and uh, I'm just sapped, okay? I'm just totally zapped. But the Lord, He just, uh, He's the one that zaps me, okay? So it fills within me His Spirit. So if you can pray for that, I used a lot of energy to create this sermon and it was very difficult. So I don't know if it's going to convict you, but I'm just going to preach my best, okay? All right, 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll read verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll read verse 13. The Apostle, Peter, uh, the Apostle Peter, he writes in a day and age what we should do so that we don't get caught up with sin, with the world, with the flesh, and the devil's attacks. A lot of times it comes at us like a surprise when Satan attacks us. A lot of times temptation seems to be strong and we cannot overcome it. A lot of times trial just hit us and then we feel like throwing in the towel as if some strange thing happened to us. And discouragement, misery, worry rises up. And the reason why people fall into sin, the reason why people get discouraged and quit the race, is because they fail to do verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says, gird up the loins of your mind. Usually, gird up your loins, that's the idea of buckle up. Why? Because... The strength of a man, that's usually a phrase referring to men. The strength of a man is in his loins. And then so you buckle up. You get ready because something dangerous is about to happen. But the Bible says it's your mind that you're buckling up. It shows how frail, fragile, sensitive, and all the strength lies within the mind. He says that you've got to be sober about it. You've got to hope to the end. Until when? Until this passage is talking about the second advent of Jesus Christ. Now, in our case, we do not wait till the second advent, but in the second coming of Christ, it consists of the pre-tribulation rapture as well as the second advent Armageddon. So we can apply this passage to ourselves in that sense. So until the rapture happens, we have to hold on. Gird up the loins of your mind. See, are you buckling up? you got to buckle up because it's going to be a wild, bumpy ride. It's going to be a wicked day and age. And in a day and age where things are falling apart, we need to buckle up. Uh, last week, I hope that you heard the sermon. And it, it, uh, it urged the importance. It, it emphasized the importance of being strong. Why? Because we're so used to being normal, being ourselves, that we never one time in our life ever thought about Okay, just one time in your li life, pull all your strength, all your mind into everything in this stressful situation that's controlling your mind and body. Just one good moment in your life. Did, did I ever give a push? If you never had that in your life, that's why the devil gets you. So you need to have that. You need to have that grit. But I want to preach to you. It's like a teaching as well to help you how to maintain that strength. And I hope that a lot of it will be practical and helpful. Let's pray. Father God, I need the filling power of your spirit again, Lord. And to be honest, I'll need you till the rapture. So you're going to have to fill me again today. I pray today's preaching will be a blessing, not a burden to the hearers. And you'll be glorified. That's all I can pray and ask, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, the first point. Notice the Bible says, uh, it says at verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. The first point is notice that Paul mentioned that there's got to be a stirring up of the mind here. See, gird up the loins of your mind. See, you got to do something with your mind. You got to arm your mind. You got to stir up the mind. The mind is so used to being complacent. You're so used to waking up in the morning and letting the mind, the flesh run its own course of the mind. Vain imaginations, normal thoughts about what to anticipate in work and in school, and then the next day, the mind being saturated with this stupid thing. Like every single day, every single day, your mind's saturated. And you have to understand that because of that, you have to 
when you start off your day, you got to stir up your mind and say, okay, this temptation is going to happen. This trial is going to happen. This hardship is going to happen. This is uh, what the devil might use against you. Be ready. Buckle up. You don't start out your day that way. You start your day with uh, coffee. Where is Sean when you need him? He needs to hear this preaching, sister. Coffee. Oh, coffee. All right, he heard that. (laughs) Coffee and then, oh, brushing teeth. Work. I got to do this. That's the first thing in the mind rather than, all right, arm yourself. And that thing's going to come. That thing's going to come. Get ready. Watch out for this. We don't do that. You don't become committed or determined. You ever thought about this way? Well, I'm struggling so much with my Bible reading and prayer. Not if you woke up in the morning and made a commitment, I'm going to read my Bible and pray. You just wake up in the morning and go. The mind just runs. And it's so important that your mind, that you got to, I mean, that mind, it's doing nothing. The flesh is the one that's moving it. TV's the one controlling it. The world's the one that's moving it. Especially this wicked environment that the brain is exposed to. It's All of this is controlling it. Once in a lifetime, can you yourself grab your brain and say, hey, get a grip on yourself. Buckle up. You're going to do this for the Lord. You're going to avoid that evil thing. And you're going to do this. And that way, you you can be happy too. You're going to, if you're worn out and you're stressed out, you're going to do this to make yourself happy and, you know, gird up your mind. You know, this worry is going to come out, this fear. Get ready, all right? When I face my boss at work, when I face that exam at school, when I confront that issue as I go through with the brethren, brain, get ready. Have you done that? You got to do that. If you don't do that, then you're always going to uh, fear. You're going to run away. And then the mind's going to be in shock when something happens to you. And it's going to be like an ugly surprise. So you need, to be re- you need to prepare your mind and have a battle plan and say, I'm going to do this, I'm determined to do this, and this, and this. No matter what, no matter what, I'm going to do this. I mean, you ever told yourself, the very least thing you can do is, if you mess up in this and this and this, at least do these three things for the Lord. You ever done it that way, at least? Do something like that. I mean, once in a lo- your lifetime, do something like that. You'd be surprised it'll do wonders. And those three little things might grow into more. So it's important to at least have a minimum thing in your mind. I'm going to at least do this for the Lord. Amen. Gird up your mind. Grab your mind. Amen. Something that you always struggle with in your life, it's time to grab your mind and say, yeah. at least I'm going to get victory in this part. At least I'm going to do this for the Lord. Amen. You know, think about it. If you never do that, then what's going to happen to your brain? You leave it exposed to everything you see, hear, and the people you encounter. And tell me if everything you see and hear and the people you encounter is 99% holy in Christianity. What do you think is 99% if you live here? If you live here? Wickedness, sin, godless depravity, immorality, worldliness, everything. And you think that if you never control your brain, that your brain's going to be all right. You know, basically, you're exp- as soon as you wake up in the morning, you're exposing your brain to a bunch of devils. And you got to realize this. These devils outnumber the population of humanity. Maybe 10 devils per human or even more than that. And you got to realize, see, then you're exposing yourself to 10 different devils, if not hundreds or even thousands of devils, because uh, thousands of them had no trouble fitting inside one human. And they're bombarding you with, here's TV, here's worry, here's fear, here's depression, here's suicide, here's guilt. You're being exposed to that every day around you in your environment and you feel like that, you'll be all right when your brain is out in the open field of a barrage of arrows flying down on it. 
you think you'll really be all right. It's like these barrage of arrows coming at you as soon as you wake up in the morning and you go, everything's going to be all right. And a million of them shot through you and that no wonder you have some sinful issues, fleshly issues, and then personality issues in your life. You know why? Those million arrows came out at you and you did nothing with your mind. You think that your brain's going to be all right? Be my guest. Let's see how well you're doing so far, not doing anything with your mind. You're just inviting those arrows to hit you all the time. You know what you're doing? You're gambling every day. It's not going to hit me. It's not going to hit me. It's not going to hit me. You do that every single day. Some of you, God forbid, for years now you've been doing that. <laughs> and the devil don't hit you once. The, the mind can be exposed easily to so many attacks and influences from this wicked world. And I know that because we are born in this wicked day and age, it's hard to discipline the flesh, discipline the mind. I understand that. I mean, you, if you look at your next generation, it scares you. You got to realize it's hard for them to get away from a screen. It's hard. For you, some of you parents might wonder, why can't I get my kid out of the screen? You know why? Because th they're from a different generation than you. They're born with a device that's even faster with the clicks, that's even more realistically vivid in a screen. And that hook, that addiction is stronger for them than for you. Now, if you think about that, that's why you have to realize, wow, I realize that this is a generation we're living in, so this is hard. This is very, very hard. So I can understand that. And that's why you need to do this thing, which you never do, which is obviously the first thing you do, but you just never do it. You need to pray. Yeah, yeah. Triple amen. Look, if you, I get it. Oh, well, pastor, it's just too tough. You're asking too much from me. No, 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 don't ask it from me, all right? I ain't going to answer your prayer. You, be, you say that to God. You come before the Lord, be genuinely honest, all right? If you don't want to disrespect him, obviously you don't want to complain and whine at him, but you need to be honest. Tell him, Lord, this is my flesh. I don't mean any disrespect for you, uh, to you, but this is my flesh. God, I just can't do it. That's how I honestly feel. That's how I honestly think. Unless you do something that I can't overcome it. And trust me, baby, God will move. You don't think he don't move? Sometimes he moves with the trial and you go, why did God do that? No, he's moving, that's why. Sometimes you don't realize that. Why, why, did, God, uh, why did God, you know, make the cable TV bill and the phone bill too high and I'm losing money? Lord, I need money. No, God's moving. He wants you to finally drop the sucker. That's why. All right? God, I have electronic addiction. Then God sends a trial. Oh, I don't have enough money to pay it. Then finally God said, finally I get you to drop it. Okay, sometimes you need to see that God will move, God will intervene, God will help. But you need to pray for it, and He will help you. It can be even through this message too, who knows? Maybe some of you are struggling with something, and then you say, God, I need something, and maybe God answered your prayer right now. God is answering it right now. I don't know how, but you need to pray. And trust me, He does it every time. He especially does it when I don't see it which is one thing I hate about how the Lord does things. A lot of times I want to see it so I can understand, but a lot of times God do does it in a way I don't see it, and then later on I understand. That always bugs me, but that's how God moves. He never fails to help you, Amen. even when you don't see it. Remember that. When you don't see it, He is helping you right now. Amen. So pray to Him, all right? Second point is soberness of the mind. Soberness of the mind. If you look at the next part of the verse, it says, be sober, yeah. be sober. The, you have to be serious. You have to be watchful. You might say, why is that? The reason why is because the Bible says that the book of 1 Peter 5, be sober. Why? Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You have to be sober-minded because that devil, like I said, there are more devils that outnumber than the population of humans. And man, they're looking for a weak spot. 
Do you think they're not going to catch you? I mean, if you got more devils outnumbering, uh, that outnumber the human population, my, 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 every one of you is already targeted then. Why? Because if ten devils not enough, then all they have to do is switch turns. And they can go 24-7 when you can't. You need to sleep. You need to take a break. You need to eat. They can run 24-7. They're eternal. So you really honestly think that uh, you don't have to search weak spots. You don't have to be guarding your weak spots. You know, why, uh, you, can't, uh, you know why your mind gets infiltrated by so many bad things and your life gets destroyed by so many bad things? It's because you never searched for your weaknesses. You weren't watchful of your weaknesses. You need to say, hey, these are my weak spots. When is the last time that you took time to pray and check your actions? When's the last time you ever did that? You're just too caught up with the hustle and bustle of normal routine that you do, right? That's, here's a bigger thought. You ready for this one? The time where people really seriously check their actions and contemplate is in preaching. And maybe that's the best one, to be honest. If that's the best one, now ask yourself this. How often then does that happen? Just once a week? And that's enough to pull you through? <laughs> Every day. Every day, right? Hey, here's a bigger one. What if it's like you skip a sermon then? That month. Then it's three sermons. That's only three times in what? 31 days? God forbid then you skip another one. And you really think you're going to be okay. That's why it's important to hear every sermon and teaching you can get. Even teaching. Because sometimes the teaching reveals something that you never thought about before. If you don't think so, how many of you have been to a teaching in this church where, oh, I never thought of that before. That's good to know. That'll be helpful to me. I'm pretty sure. If, I, if you didn't, I'm not doing my job, okay? That's the point why you come to church. So why are you wasting your time, your opportunity, your advantage and that God has given to you? You got to realize you coming to church is not helping out the pastor. You coming to church is helping you. And you're rejecting every time you're helping yourself. You know what's scarier? People think skipping church is helping them. That's scarier. Because I'm too tired. I'm too busy. I'm this and that and that and that. Bible reading and prayer, if you skip that first thing in the morning, I pity you. Literally, you cannot live a day without praying and reading the Bible. It's so important. Why? You need to guard your mind. Guard your mind. You need to start out your day, Lord, protect me. Lord, help me with this issue. Lord, uh, make me be happy here and there. You need to do that. If you don't do that, good luck to you because you don't have any luck. I'll tell you what your problem is. Those weak areas that you have, you think like this. Oh, I know I have this issue, you know. I, I have a, a weakness issue right here, but... Ah, it's okay, I'll be all right. See, you're gambling again. You're risking again. You know what you did right there? You trust those weaknesses of yours, those vulnerability spots of yours, more than God. Now that's scary. So you trust, you know what you trust? You trust those open opportunities, those open fields of sin, more than God? That's a distorted mindset right there. I don't trust that open field of sin and think that I'm not going to get hit. I don't trust sin with a 10-foot pole even. But you trust sin so much that you'll even hug, embrace, and kiss it. And then with the Holy Spirit of God, you push it away and reject it. 
You know what I would do? I would cling on to this book more than the world out there. I'd cling on to prayer more than my job and sec any secular thing out there. Why? Because I do not trust, I do not trust the open opportunities of sin out there. But that's what people have done. They've trusted it. That's why Facebook can keep getting away with this stuff, even though there's such a thing called social media addicts that even liberal scholars and universities are preaching against. And that was even brought up before the government, how it was done to lure a younger generation and hook them. That's no secret to any denomination, religion, or liberal system. Everyone knows that. But you know why they allow that? People trust People trust the open opportunity of their consuming desires more than God, more than morality, more than safety. That's scary. I'd be scared to death if I were you. Do you realize that you trust, you trust that serpent in the Garden of Eden more who's hissing at you? You didn't touch sin yet. You didn't touch sin yet, sin yet but you trust that serpent hissing at you more than the Lord saying, hey, come walk and talk with me in the garden. I'd be scared if I were you. I'd be scared of myself if I were you. And I know the idea like, oh, I need to, uh, but you know, you don't understand, Pastor. I can't do this because, you know, I'm weak or I'm physically unable to do that or I'm just too busy. Busy, 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 busy. That's one of the number one excuses. Or, you know, I got a health deficit. Or, you know, just that person in church I just can't get along with. Or, you don't know my history that I went through that's hard to overcome. You know, another thing you got to realize is this, is that do you trust yourself or do you trust God more? All right. Do you trust yourself or God more? You tr if you trust God, why not just step out by faith and do it? But you know what's so scary? You're trusting yourself and you're bringing up these things. Well, I can't do it because of this, because of this. And you're in your comfort zone, so to speak, because it's called you. That's what this comfort zone is. You're used to doing things. And because of that, you're finding solace in there. But I would like to ask you a simple question. How well are you doing with that? You still get sad. You still get depressed. You still go through problems in life. So how well are you doing? I'll tell you every single, every single person who'd stepped out of their comfort zone and are in God, every single person, they did well. Everyone, no matter what trial or bad situation that happened. It's once they got out of there and got in here, that's when it fell apart. God never fails. I've been through too much pain and problems and impossible scenarios that I know what I'm talking about, that he is real, he will take care of you. But that would just be arrogance on my part to say it to you. You need to search it yourself. You need to experience that yourself. Why not take a leap of faith and start doing it? Why not believe his word and then see what happens? The, those things, you, aren't you scared of, to trust yourself? Here's, a, here's the scarier thought. Aren't you scared to trust in your excuses? Aren't you scared to trust in your excuses more than the great I am that I am who controls every scenario and situation? You don't stoop low enough to think, I desperately need God. I desperately need Bible reading, prayer, church. I desperately need to stay away from sin. You, you, don't feel, you don't hear that Holy Spirit crying out within you saying, I'm hungry. I need to eat. Give me spiritual food. And that flesh, you just trust that evil thing of yours, that flesh where it's growing even more and more and more, and it's controlling your life to a point where you think, I cannot change what I am anymore. I cannot do what you're asking me to do, Pastor. It's impossible. My third point is suspense of the mind. Suspense of the mind. If you look at the last part of verse 13, and hope to the end. 
for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You, uh, the thing is, with your mind, now you're being sober, watching out for your weak spots. But just because you tell your mind, all right, I'm going to read the Bible today and pray. That's the first step, right? Stirring of the mind. Leads to the second step. All right, being sober. Okay, watch out for this. You know that weak spot of yours, that vulnerability spot. So you're going to stay away from that. You don't trust that thing. You don't trust that thing. You're scared to death of that thing. So stay away from that. And you're being sober, but just living off of that won't get you going. You know why? You need something in there to fulfill it. Staying away from fleshly things that fulfilled your fleshly desires all the time is just going to make you uh, no different from a monk in a monastery in a Catholic church system or a Buddhist. They think they can empty everything, empty their desires. You cannot live that way. Human, human desire is in there and you'll never erase that. You need to fulfill it. And that's the problem. You know what Satan did? Well, before I t mention that, you know what God did? And then I'll tell you what Satan did if my mind remembers it because I'm tired. <laughs> But what God did was he understands that. So he fulfilled your desire. He says, I'm going to, you might go, then where is the life worth meaning? What can I do? I'm emptied, separated from everything good in life. And God says, child, you got me. Amen. You got salvation in Jesus Christ where you are saved from hell. Isn't it good to know that you got me eternally stuck inside you and no matter what sin you commit in the future, you're still bound for heaven with me and there is a meaning in life that no matter how miserable or how bad your current life is, that you got a million times years that will pay it back in full for eternity. And not only that, am I not a God that provides all your needs? Am I not a God that says all things work together for good? Am I not a God who not just owns all of heaven but all the world? And so I can give you richly good things to enjoy as well. Am I not a God that I said I will never leave thee nor forsake thee? Haven't I given you good brethren in church to encourage you? Haven't I given you a good pastor to preach and teach to you? Haven't I given you my word to keep clinging on to hope and to find truth? Haven't I given you my Holy Spirit who promised to lead and guide you in uncertain futures? Have not I even given to you food to eat? clothes on your back, a home to live in? Have I not given you money? Have I not even given you things that you have that other people don't even have? Physical, worldly, secular things that you have that other people don't even have. Now, why don't you cling on to that good thing? You know what your problem is? See, the devil's successful attempt is he made you forget those things. And he made you keep clinging on to where that fleshly, sinful addiction lies that controls you. And no matter how many good things you have, let me tell you this. A fearful person who struggles with, with fear will never be happy and will never look at the good things of life. No matter how big it is. A fearful person will always remain fearful. The same thing with... A, uh, that same thing with a depressed person will always remain depressed. A lustful person will always remain lustful. A covetous person will always remain covetous. A greedy person will always remain greedy. A miserable person will always remain miserable no matter how good things, how many good things the Lord gives. Then how do I conquer this misery that's sticking to me? Get rid of it! Don't let it cling onto you like glue. You need to cast it off and then you'll finally enjoy even the little good things. Amen. Now that's good preaching, amen. I'll say that, okay? Amen. Don't let that thing dictate and control your life. Cast it off and then start clinging on to those things that God has given to fulfill you. Amen. you got to realize that you've got a significant other that other people don't have. You got children that even rich people don't have and they're paying amounts of money to adopt or other kinds of endeavors to produce children. You guys got things in your life, even secular things of this world that you got that other people don't have. You need to look at that every time and that verse is hope to the end. So you got to cling on to that thing. You got to hold on to that and say, you know, don't let sin rob you of the good things in life. 
Don't let that fleshly mind rob you of the good things that you have because it does happen. You know that? And then when, God, when the devil takes away your good thing and says, ha ha, what the Lord blessed you with, it's finally mine because I traded you off with some muck that I tempted you with. You can have that one and I'll, I, I'm glad I stole this one away from you. And then, you know what? That's, it's at that time you're going to open your eyes and realize that was a good thing I had. Yeah. Why did I take church for granted? Why did I take my family for granted? Why did I take that book for granted? Why did I take even the physical things of this earth for granted God has given to me? Then you're going to open your eyes. And guess what? You can cling and seek it out all you want, but you'll never get it back. That's why I cling on to what you got because it's all you got. It's the only thing you got. Your problem is you can have more. That's what you think. You think you can have more. No, no. Just know the real reality. This is all I've got. There's nothing more out there. This is all I've got. I need to come to that realization and take what I have and use it to the best of my life and fulfill my life every moment with the things that I got. Amen. You need to do that. Why? Because everybody, generally, I'm not going to say like specifically everybody, but I could say generally, if I asked everybody, you know, do you have some regrets that you had in life and that you'd want to do over? Obviously, generally, people would say yes. Do you know why? Usually what you find out is this when people say that, that they, there are some things they want to take back or do over. It's because they wish they did something better with what they did have in their life. They wished that they did something better with the ability that they had, but they just never did it. That's why cling on to what you have. It's the only thing you got. And the devil's deception, especially with this kind of world, is make you think there's another thing out there. And then lose this thing that you have. Lose this good thing the Lord has blessed you with. And then when you grow older, you're going to realize, I wasted this and this and this that I could have done better. And to enjoy life more. To become a better person. Don't waste it. Cling on to that good thing that God has given to you. A lot of times it's hard to cling on to the good thing that we have because... uh, the flesh always produces doubt. It's inevitable. That flesh is so wicked and so weak that an example is this, is that let's say the good thing is going to church and you know you're going to get right with God, you're going to get encouraged, you're going to have brethren singing and all that to keep you going. And you know it, that's a good thing you've got. But then that stupid weak flesh of yours says, you're just too tired. You're just too old and You know you're busy. You need to catch up your work. You need to catch up your sleep. And that's that wicked devil doing that to you. And you know why he does that? He does that stuff to you so that you can doubt it. And then have you ever, I don't know if this happened to you before. It happened to me lots of times. When I said, no, I'm going to go to church. And then the flesh is doubting, you know, it's driving. And then you go a long way and you're like, oh, I can't wait to go home to take a nap. And then... When you get to church, you hear, you get to fellowship, singing and preaching, and then you go back home and you're like, man, I was encouraged. I feel better. So then you just proved yourself wrong, right? And you went, I'm glad I went, right? I'm glad I went. That's what happens. The thing is this, is that you know that good thing God has given to you makes you happy. And then when you did that happy thing, You proved your flesh wrong, didn't you? Okay. Then why do you still trust your flesh when it keeps doubting? When it keeps questioning? You trust more of that flesh than the God who has given you good things. Than his word that says, this will make you happy, do this. You need to... The thing is this, is that even sometimes, I don't know if this happens to you, sometimes the flesh knows that too. The flesh says... Yes, you'll be happy if you do that, but look, it's just so hard to do it, so don't do it. You know, uh, just get that over with. Just get that flesh wrong, you know, and just say, 
okay, yes, it will make me happy, so why don't I just do it? Just go for it then. Do it. Overcome that flesh. Prove it wrong. The greatest trick from Satan that I want to close with is for you to get convicted. But you're thinking about just getting convicted and doing something about it. That's it. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is this, is that, see, you're, you're buckled up right now, most of you probably. You're buckled up. The sermon got you. And your mind is finally stirring up, finally being sober, and finally uh, in the suspense. So that was the third point, is the suspense of the bind. Now it's like, has that anticipation, that excitement of, okay, these are the good things what God has promised. I got to cling on to it. You have all that in your mind, okay? And you're like, okay, mind, it's time to change. Okay. And you tell your mind, it's time to commit to the Lord. I'll do this, I'll do that. But here's the dangerous thing, which is very smart. You do think about that, but have you ever asked yourself this? When? You said, yeah, I'm going to win a soul. Yeah, I'm going to stay away from sin. Yeah, I'm going to do that. But when? How about you tell your mind right now on the altar? And before today is over, I'm going to commit in doing this and this and this. I bet you most people don't think like that. They think about getting right with God and serving God on the altar, go back, but you're not thinking about exactly when. You know what you did? You fell back to the same trap that the devil got you in. You know what you need to do? You need to say, now's the time. I'm going to get on this altar, and I'm going to commit to now. And now! Serve God now. Don't let the devil trick you. Buckle up, because the devil... He's deceiving you right now, perhaps. Every head bow and every eye shut. Buckle up on this altar. Buckle up. Lock yourself. Strap yourself in. Protect that mind. Tell it, you're not going to take advantage of me. I'm going to commit to this to the Lord. Amen. Don't let the devil get you. The piano will just uh, play one song, and he'll keep playing it over and over. Buckle up. That adversary is, wants to get you. You know how he gets you? It all starts with the mind. It all starts with the mind. It's about time that you take the mind for yourself. This is your mind, not the devil's mind, not the imprisoned flesh. It's your mind. Take control of it this time and say, I commit this time to do this good thing, to do that good thing, to stay away from these bad things. Commit. Buckle up. Prove that flesh wrong. Prove that devil wrong. Prove the world wrong. Stir yourself up. Tell your mind, this is what I commit to the Lord. I am going to do this and this and this. You say, that's hard for me to do, Pastor then you need to pray, like I said. You need to pray. You need to be honest with God. God, I can't. It's so hard for me. You need to help me. You need to do something for me. Do you have even a minimal thing in your mind? At the very least today, I am going to do this and this and this for the Lord. Do you even have a... Just a few things, just a few things you can commit to? Or are you going to expose your mind out in the open field again, 24-7, with those billions of devils throwing billions of arrows, and then you're going to get hit? You need to look at your weak spots. You know what they are now the place you're living in, the scenario you put yourself into, the timing of the schedule, the people you're around with, you know your weaknesses. It's now time 
to look at those weak spots and to be scared to death of those things and to not trust them, not even an ounce of it. Don't ever trust those things. Don't ever, ever trust your weakness. Be scared to death of them and stay away from them. The tendency of us today is to say, well, I'm too weak, I'm too old, I can't do it, or it's too late. Uh, I'm just too busy and don't trust your excuses more than the Lord. The Lord's the one who created everything. Scenarios and situations cannot happen without God. That's how you develop those excuses. Every one of those scenario situations you use as an excuse, it's all under God's hand. You need to trust Him. Think about it. What are your regrets? What do you wish that you could take back when you look back in the years of your life? See, now's that time to do it. Now's that time to make changes. Now's that time to commit. The greatest trick from the enemy is to always make you think later is the greatest trick of the enemy is to convict you now and say okay I, i'll change and i'll do this and this and this for the lord but you will not say when and that will be the greatest trick his greatest trick is you can cry you can weep you can repent you can get right with the lord but you don't think when you don't think now you don't think as soon as i get back home i'm gonna do it now because you're just repeating a cycle again as soon as you go back home. As soon as you're back home, away from church, away from the conviction of the Holy Spirit, away from the brethren around you who's producing that atmosphere from the Holy Spirit moving, when you're away from that, you're repeating a cycle. Overcome by the grace of God. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I want to thank you so much for the protection of your word, from the protection of your spiritual things you've given to us, even physical. But Lord, the greatest trick of the devil is for us to throw them away and for our mind to be exposed to so much trash out there in this godless, wicked day and age. Protect us, Father, because we are so weak. Lord, I'll admit it. I'll admit it openly. I am so weak, Father. I don't know how I'm able to be what I am today had it truly not been for your grace. And that's why I keep pleading with you. I keep pleading with you to protect me, to save me, to guard me, to help me. And God, you help me so much, so much more than I could even do. It's not even my own efforts. You did it so many times for me. Will you do so with these people? Because your word said your grace is greater than all our sins. Give that special grace to them. Where your word promised, my grace is sufficient for thee. For strength is made perfect in weakness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.